Moving on to the next layer of skin is the dermis. The dermis is the middle region of the skin, and it's often called the functional layer of skin. The reason it's called this is because most of the structures that provide the functions that we think about when we think about skin are found in the dermis. There is extensive connective tissue in the dermis. Collagen is one of the tissues that you'll find, and collagen is what gives your skin its strength. Like your skin just isn't going to tear apart because it has strong fibers that compose it. It's not like a flimsy piece of paper. And then you also have a lot of elastin in your skin. And elastin's job is to stretch and then to recoil. So if you think about your elbow, when you bend your elbow, the skin on your elbow has to be able to stretch to allow that to happen. Um, without elastin, your skin could just break apart at your elbow. Plus, the recoil is also important. Once we stretch the skin, when we move a body part or we like bend our elbow, we want to make sure that the skin then doesn't remain stretched out. It should recoil and go back to its original um, kind of composition. The dermis is vascularized. There's an extensive blood supply that is supplying all the different parts of the dermis. And this is how the epidermis is then relying upon its nutrients through diffusion. Unlike the epidermis, there's only two layers to the dermis. And the top layer of the dermis is the papillary layer. On the papillary layer, there are unique projections that are called dermal papillae. And these are what actually gives us our fingerprints. So the top of the papillary layer has all these ridges. And when the epidermis is over the top of it, it basically forms to those ridges. So think about if you had a bunch of clothes on your floor and you then threw a sheet over them. The sheet is going to take the shape of those piles of clothes on your floor, just like the epidermis is going to take the shape of the dermal papillae of the papillary layer. The reason we have fingerprints is to enhance gripping and to increase friction. So when we hold on to things, they don't just slip out of our hands. And fingerprints are actually formed in utero before we're born. This is some extra information, but it's really cool to think about how our fingerprints are formed. So if you look at those images, A, B, and C, those show the growth of the hand, the fetal hand. It starts kind of like a paddle, and then eventually we can see the separate fingers. And by picture C, we see this enlargement on the top of the fingers that are called the finger pads. So what ends up happening during the second to third month of gestation, the bottom layer of the epidermis outgrows the inner layer and outer epidermis. So a bubble-like pad forms. And you can see how those look in those images kind of in the middle of the page. Now this is eventually what's gonna cause the fingerprints. And this is also why everyone's fingerprints, even identical twins are different because the position of the fetus in the womb how active the fetus is, um, the composition of the amniotic fluid is going to affect every finger and pad differently. So um, we have this genetic component to form the finger pads, but then the environment in which they're forming in creates an, in, an individually unique print on every finger in every individual. So about the fourth month of gestation, the expanded pads start to shrink. And when they shrink, that skin buckles, and that's how we end up with the ridges we know of as our fingerprints. So that was all about the papillary layer, the top layer of the dermis. The bottom layer is called the reticular layer. And this is about 80% of the dermis. So it's much thicker than the papillary layer. We're gonna find a lot of collagen and elastin fibers here. This is also where stretch marks 
are originating from. A stretch mark is a scar in the reticular layer of the dermis that forms from damage to the collagen and elastin. And oftentimes stretch marks come from the skin being stretched very rapidly, almost too rapidly for the skin to be able to keep up with it. Here again is a slide that's just giving you extra information about stretch marks. So stretch marks are scars that develop when the skin stretches or shrinks quickly. It causes collagen and elastin to rupture. And so then as the body's trying to heal that, you start to see these stretch marks. Um, very common during pregnancy because the abdomen is increasing in size so rapidly. Um, but it can also happen just from growth spurts that happen in puberty, um, rapid weight loss or gain. If you're doing a lot of weight training and you're rapidly building muscle, this can happen to your skin as well. When they first form, they are going to be a lot darker. So they could be red, purple, pink, reddish brown, dark brown. It all depends on the melanin composition in your skin. Um, early on, they can feel raised. So they'll actually be a higher level on your skin and they might even be itchy. But eventually over time, that coloration fades and they actually feel like a depression. And then they are permanent because it's a scar. Your skin had healed a damaged portion of it. And so you're going to have that as a permanent remnant of that healing process. Also in the dermis, uh, wrinkles are formed. Wrinkles are creases in the skin due to the weakening of the collagen and the elastin fibers. It's a natural effect of aging and environmental factors. So again, some extra information specifically about wrinkles. Um, a small percent of wrinkles is actually due to chronological aging. So we're all going to get wrinkles because of getting older. After age 20, your bodies are producing less collagen. The collagen and elastin become thicker and looser. The skin becomes more inelastic and more brittle. And the skin's attempt to stretch back and forth turn into visible lines. So as early as your 20s, those things are happening to your skin. By age 40, Collagen production stops. Collagen and elastin that are present begin to break and stiffen, and skin cell turnover slows. So you're not replacing your skin as quickly, and it's taking longer for those skin cells to grow and divide. By age 50, the skin has become a lot thinner, and there's fewer blood vessels in the skin, which is also a reason why your skin, the cells aren't growing or healing as well. And there's a decrease in circulation because of that as well. So all of those are intrinsic. That's gonna happen to all of us no matter what. But most of the wrinkling that we see is actually due to extrinsic aging or environmental aging. Um, repeated facial expressions. That is gonna cause certain parts of your face to show more wrinkling. Smoking, um, the action has the same effect as expression lines. So doing that repeated facial expression over and over again. Plus nicotine decreases blood flow. And what's going to happen is the skin actually becomes oxygen deprived. And with that oxygen deprivation, the skin starts to sag. Um, pollution just in our air just our normal pollution we're exposed to, um, can pull electrons from other body molecules, can alter chemical, chemical structures and accelerate aging. And the big one is exposure to the sun. Photo aging is the biggest contributor of wrinkles. So about 80% of your wrinkles are gonna be due to your sun exposure. Um, UVA rays break down the collagen and elastin, cause sunspots, rough texture, pigmentation problems, and could lead to skin cancer. So that's why there's such a push to protect your skin, your skin from the sun, 
not just because of that skin cancer risk, but because it's also going to help um, the health of your skin as you age. One more um, thing associated with the dermis are cleavage lines. So cleavage lines are imaginary lines that indicate the orientation of collagen. So we can't actually see these lines, but we know that the collagen is running in certain directions in certain parts of the body. And you can see that in the diagram that's shown on the right. And these are really important in terms of like surgery or um, if you injure yourself and may or may not need stitches. So if there's a cut in the skin along a cleavage line, most of the fibers are going to remain intact. So we're looking at like this picture right here. The edges of the cut are gonna to stay together and there's gonna be very little scarring. On the other hand, if a cut occurs across a cleavage line, like we see here, the fibers are gonna pull apart and the cut is gonna gape open. It's more likely to need stitches because it's not gonna close up nicely on its own. And then you are also more at risk of scarring because of that wider opening in the cut. Now this is some extra information that you don't have in your notes packet, um, but this is how permanent tattoos are permanent as opposed to what we talked about earlier with temporary tattoos. Permanent tattoos use a gun that injects ink into the dermis. And the needles of the tattoo gun can puncture the skin 50 to 3,000 times per minute, depending on um, what kind of art is going onto the skin. Every puncture deposits a drop of ink into the dermis. This whole process damages the epidermis because the skin's going through the epidermis and then the papillary layer of the dermis. And the layers are what we call homogenized. Everything becomes like all mush together because of that repeated needle going into the skin. What happens is that actually triggers the body's immune response. And so first thing your body does is it tries to stop the bleeding from the broken capillaries. So you might get some scabbing after a tattoo. And then swelling occurs. And the swelling is because white blood cells are coming to that area to try to get rid of that foreign ink. Unfortunately for your immune system, the ink is, the ink molecules are much larger than the white blood cells. And so the white blood cells are trying to break it down, but they're being unsuccessful. And so you can actually see that in the diagrams that we have over here to the right. Um, these two YouTube videos that we have over here on the left, if you want to take a look at those, those are um, about the process of tattooing itself. Now, there's different stages of healing that happen with tattoos. So immediately after that tattoo, ink is all dispersed. About a month after the tattoo, the ink becomes more concentrated in the papillary layer of the dermis. And two to three months after the tattoo, some of the ink has actually been eliminated from the epidermis. So like you can see in this second picture here, there was some ink that was in the epidermis. By this time, the epidermal cells have gone through their cycle and have been sloughed off. So all that's gonna be left is the ink that's in the papillary layer. Um, and so at this point, two to three months, everything should be healed. Now over time, there will be changes to that tattoo because even though the immune system wasn't successful at breaking down that ink, your immune cells are going to continue to try to break it down because it still sees that as foreign um, material in the body. And as that happens, the ink actually moves deeper and deeper into the dermis. And as it does that, the ink appears more faded and blurry because you're looking at it through more layers of skin as it gets deeper. Um, it seems that some colors disappear completely. White, yellows, reds, and flesh tones over time seem to completely disappear. 
part of that's probably because the white blood cells start to be successful at breaking some of those down. And other reasoning would be it's just getting so far down into the dermis that it's hard to see. Um, sun exposure is going to accelerate the skin's response to try to um, remove that ink from the body. And so that's why sun exposure, you want to limit that on tattoos. Now, permanent tattoos are permanent. However, there are laser treatments that try to remove them as much as possible. So here you can see an animation of laser removal and what it does. Here, you can actually watch a short video. And here are some pictures of an individual who went through the removal process um, and you can see the results. But what happens is what the laser does is it shatters the ink molecules and it's making them small enough so the white blood cells can come in and disintegrate them and break them down. Um, usually you need multiple sessions. It's usually six to eight 30 minute sessions required because you need time in between the sessions for white blood cells to do their job and for healing to take place before the next session. Um, and it all depends on the size and the coloration of the tattoo, how many sessions and how long the sessions will be.